Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I just found out something kind of cool as I was looking at my calendar. Does anyone know what happens eight weeks from today? You've been looking at your calendar too? It's the first day of spring. Eight weeks from today. Until then, what beautiful winter weather if you like winter. Amen. And I'm getting no nods back. <laughs> okay. Thank you for being here. Welcome to our other campuses, Cincy, Bainbridge, Online, Green Campus. Can we welcome all of our other campuses joining us today? We get to wrap up our New Year's series, Selfless, talking about choices that we make. And often when a new year hits, we, well, we used to call them resolutions, but we stopped calling them that because who keeps resolutions past the first week of January? Anyway, so you make goals, goals to better yourself, your diet, whatever. And I think what we've uh, maybe agreed on is that most of our goals tend to be fairly selfish. Right? It's about my diet, my physical self, my family, my work, my goals, that sort of thing. And, and ultimately, God's purpose for us is not to pursue us. The reason that we're here on planet Earth is so that we can pursue who, my friends? Him, and that we can serve others. And so that's what we've been talking about for the last three weeks. We talked about how to be bold in spirit and share the hope that's in us to others. We talked about how to be faithful in service and serve unselfishly the people around us. And last week we learned how to be extravagant in generosity and be generous as God has been generous to us. Today, we're going to look at one more unselfish choice, one more selfless attitude. Typically, when I speak, I, I don't give kind of the big idea till the end of the message. Today, we're going to do the opposite. I'm going to give it to you up front. So you can write this down and then just check out. Here you go. Here's the big idea this morning. To be self, uh, grateful in the grind. Read this with me. Be grateful in the grind. Okay, it's almost like when I said you like winter, the same response. Um, some of you are like, Justin, I want to wring your skinny neck. Right? You have bad thoughts about me right now. Let, 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 me, let me pause, because I know the reaction for most of us when we, when we think of being grateful in the grind. For most of us, life is very much a grind right now. Can I get an amen? Very much a grind. And you're like, Justin, with, with kind of COVID issues surging, with, with political mandates and government mandates causing hardships, with supply chain issues, with uh, being a midterm election year and political tensions are boiling with just one issue after the other. This is a grind. And now you want to add one more thing. You want me to be grateful in that grind? I've got something I want to tell you. So, so let, let me have you do something for me this morning. First of all, breathe for my sake and yours. It'll be okay because I'm not going to lay a new burden on you today, kind of lay a, a religious burden on you, something else you can't keep, or, or put a standard that's a spiritual standard that you can't live up to. That's not it at all today. Today we're just going to talk about a new attitude that God can give us to help us see the grind differently, and when we see the grind differently, we might live through the grind differently. To, to get there, there's really a verse that we need to look at, and it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So if you wouldn't mind turning there in your copy of the Bible, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, there's just one verse in this chapter that I want us to look at. Uh, yeah, if you want to use your chair Bible, you can do that too. It's page 923 in your chair Bible. And uh, feel free, if you'd like a Bible, if you want one that's easier to understand perhaps than yours, take that with you as our, as our gift. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. One of the last verses in there. It says this, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. L let's read that again. Make sure it sinks in for a moment. So whether you eat or drink or 
whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Let me get real with you this morning. For, for much of my life, I've kind of lived with this illusion that there's something just around the corner that I can't wait for. And I tease you with spring eight weeks from now. But, but for me, there's often that, that event or that milestone that I'm looking forward to and, and really can't wait for, something out there that's going to fulfill something in me and, and, and give me more meaning or, or excitement or whatever the case is. And I'll give you an example of how this has often played out in my life. And there's probably a version of this story in your story too. But when I was young, I was taught that Jesus could return at any moment. And when Jesus returned, it would kind of initiate a series of events that would lead to eternity and end with heaven. And so it was this excitement of, yeah, I believe that. I believe Jesus is going to return. I'm looking forward to it. But boy, I'd love to drive first. So, you know, I would have these little discussions with God. God, you know I'm excited for you to come back. You know I'm excited for heaven. But could you hold off? Could you delay it till I'm 16? Because I would love to be able to drive. Believe it or not, he actually waited. And, and then it was, you know, God, this is fun, but mom or dad are always in the car with me. Could you hold off till I get the license? Because I would love the independence of driving alone. Right? And, and then it was, wow, this is awesome, but boy, I'd love to own my own car first and have, have just kind of the fun of taking care of it and tricking it out and, you know, the pride of my own car. Mark's shaking his head. You know Mark, right? It, and then it was, you know, boy, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to you coming back, Jesus, but, boy, it would be really fun if, if I could graduate. Like, I'm looking forward to graduating. And then it was, whew, you know, there's one more thing. I really, really want to get married could you just hold off? And, and there's so many things I can't wait to experience in marriage. And, and, then, and then after that, it's, well, you know, I think it'd be cool to have some kids. So could you wait till we have a couple? You know, and, and then it's, well, wait a minute. I, I would love to own our own home. So I, I'm excited. You know, I'm glad you're coming. But just could you hold off? And I want to experience the joy and the pride of having our own our own home. And, and, and then it's something that, you know, it's, it's a big family vacation. And, you know, you can come, but just wait till after that vacation. And more recently, it's like, God, would you mind just waiting until the Bills win the Super Bowl? <laughs> and Jesus is like, I'm not waiting that long, buddy. <laughs> but do you see a pattern here? There, there's always something just around the corner that's somehow going to fulfill me or, or give me what it is that I want. It's out there. And, and I think many of us, the way we're wired, we're looking for that next, that next achievement, that next possession, that next milestone, that next thing. And, and, and some of you, it's, it's a little different. You're like, man, I'm, I'm not necessarily looking for that. I'm just looking for hitting that place of stability. Like, man, when that relationship is finally over, then. You know, or when that person's finally gone, or when I finally get out of this work situation or whatever it is, then I'll have arrived to that place I'm looking forward to. And the challenge with that mindset is the world's constantly reinforcing that. The world's constantly telling us that we should follow our hearts and indulge ourselves and discover what makes us happy and fulfill our passions and advertisements which we're bombarded with constantly are always showing us that there's just one more thing we need or one more place to be, one more thing that if we're willing to part with a little bit of our money, they'll help us get there. And, and the challenge for that is that when we get there, there's often then just the next thing the next goal, the next dream, the next milestone. Or, or we get there and we're like, wow, this is harder than I thought. This isn't as great as I thought. There's a new challenge. There's a new tension. There's a new frustration. There's a new brokenness. And so we, we start looking forward to that, that next 
thing. And here's the challenge that, that's the rub here. Our soul is yearning for something we can't find down here. Because Jesus said it this way. If anyone wants to follow me, he must, she must do what? Deny yourself. Right? Jesus said that if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself. I'm guessing this wasn't a phrase you heard in a graduation speech. Right? If you want to be my disciple, you don't pursue your passions, you don't follow your heart, you don't look forward to the next thing. If you want to follow me, Jesus says, you're going to have to deny yourself. And so you get to what Paul's saying here, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And I think the challenge is so much of our lives are filled with mundane things, things that we don't find exciting, things that we don't take much joy in. And and maybe it's doing the laundry, and you're like, how do we keep having this much dirty laundry? Dishes? How do they get this dirty? This often? Right? Cleaning out the, the... the hallway with the muddy shoes, the the car, you just washed it last week, but it looks like you were in a mud bowl with it. What in the world? And there's always that feeling of this isn't fun or this isn't good. There's something out there that's better. And what if, what if there was a lie in that thinking? That around the corner type thinking that somehow around the corner something's going to be there that's somehow better than what's here. I have a few questions to ask you this morning. Three questions. What if the work is the reward? I know some of you are really bummed to even consider that. But, but here's the deal. Work was literally part of creation in Genesis 1 and 2. When God created a perfect earth, he created work. The indication is that heaven someday is going to include, you say it, not me. Yeah, work. And, and there's something about work that is part of the reward of living. There's a satisfaction and accomplishment that comes just through work Work that's done with the right attitude. Work that's done for the glory of God. What if, what if the work is at least part of the reward? The very thing we're trying to get through or past is actually part of the reward. Here's another question. What if the prize is actually in the process? So often, we are trying to get out of the mess, the the grief, the struggle, the frustration, whatever. As soon as I'm out, then I can breathe, then I can relax, then it will be better. But what if in the process is where God puts the prize? What if? What if? What if? (laughs) There you go. You could be grateful. In the grind. If if you would take your Bible and just go forward a few pages to chapter 15. The guy who wrote, do all these things for the glory of God, he said a, a couple other things that I want us to see this morning. And Craig Rochelle and Life Church, as they were preparing this series, which they've shared with us and has really impacted my life, and I'm so grateful for that, there was something in chapter 15 that he brought out that I want to bring out to you today also. Verse 9, Paul says this. He says, I am the what of all the apostles? I am the least of all the apostles. Does anyone else ever feel like that? Like, I am the least of all the Christians. Man, I, I am just unworthy. In fact, he says that. In fact, I am not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. Paul's like, I have a past, and I am not proud of my past. 
Right? There, is, there is a tremendous sense, if, if he let himself, a tremendous sense of shame and guilt that was associated with his past and the things that he did. And he's like, I, I, I wasn't rescued by God because I was good. I was rescued by God because he is good. And I, and I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to be called his follower, let alone to be used by him. And Paul just had that approach to life where he just realized, I am totally undeserving of anything good. I am totally undeserving even to be called his kid. And then he says this in verse 10. But whatever I am now, <laughs> whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me. Listen, if you're a child of God, your past is forgiven and your life is now a walk of the favor of God on it every moment of every day. Whether you know it or not, whether you realize it or not, even whether you feel it or not, or not you live and breathe and work and rest with the favor of God poured out on your life. And so Paul's like, I get it. Whatever I am now, whatever I am, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me and not without results. For I have worked, what's he say next? Harder than any of the other apostles. Yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace. Now you read that and the indication is, wait a minute. Paul's just claiming that he's working harder than any of the other apostles. What do we call that? bragging, or maybe complaining, right? A bunch of lazy bums. And, and, I, and I don't think it's either. I don't think Paul's complaining. There's no indication here that he's complaining. There's no indication that he's even bragging. I think he's just being transparent here. He's like, I've just been so transformed by Jesus, and I realize how undeserving I am that it's motivated me to work hard, and not just to work hard, but to work harder than anyone else around me. I mean, I give it my all. And if Paul was here, and if I could interview him here, I mean, it'd be cool, first of all. But I think he would tell us a little bit of his story about working hard. Like, I think he would be honest with us, and he would admit, like, when other people went to bed, Paul would say, I I actually would stay up later. And I'd pray a little bit longer and strategize a a little bit longer than everybody else. And when other people were still sleeping in, I was actually, I was up, I was out at work, I was getting things accomplished. I was built, making tents so that I, could, that I could earn a living. And I was going and, and mentoring. And, and I was doing things for Jesus with everything in me. And I was, I was shipwrecked a few times. And I was actually beaten up quite a few times. And I was bit by a poisonous snake. Yeah, that one wasn't fun. I shook the thing off. Somehow I survived. But while others took shortcuts, while others tried to relax, I just kept doing the right thing. And, and, I, and I spent time in his word and I memorized much of it. And I even got the privilege of writing some of it. And I raised up leaders even when I didn't have a budget or resources. And I, and I just got the job done. I, I managed to start churches in cities where they didn't even have a single Christian. I served Jesus even when I was in prison. I worked harder than anyone else. Wherever I was, I was all there. And whatever I did, I did it for the glory of God. What about you? Maybe maybe you're changing diapers. Maybe you're making sales calls. Maybe... You're doing the laundry. Maybe you're working at a factory. Maybe you're doing stuff for your boss that feels pretty unexciting. And and you say, man, maybe I need a change of perspective. Maybe these things that I'm doing, these Monday, everyday things, these mundane things that have no significance to me, that have no excitement to me, what if I declare that I am doing these things for the glory of God? And this task, as boring as it may be, I'm going to claim it as a task that's a divine task. And I will do it for the glory of God. 
And I'm going to realize that maybe the work is the reward and maybe the prize is in the process. And every day, as I'm grinding out the normal things, I can just say, I am grateful. Let me ask you, when tomorrow comes, Monday, Monday's everybody's favorite day of the week. When Monday comes and that boredom or frustration or discouragement hits, right, and things don't go right, the weather's not right, the kids aren't right, your spouse isn't right, they're never right, right, your boss isn't right, whatever the case is, your family member's not right, what if you just say, God, I choose in this moment to be grateful. I choose to claim this moment and this task as a divine opportunity to be grateful. And in the grind, I will do this thing for your glory. Nehemiah put it this way many years ago. He said, don't be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Does anyone else ever feel weak? The joy of the Lord is the strength of people who are weak. And I know that doesn't logically compute, but it's something supernatural where when I'm grateful in the grind, I, t- I do things for the glory of God. There is a joy that fills my life that gives me strength to do things I don't want to do. And to enjoy things that are not enjoyable. But there's a couple enemies to being grateful in the grind. In fact, there's two that I want to highlight this morning. The one enemy to being grateful in the grind is this thing right here. Getting sleepy, just holding it. All right? Some of you are like, what in the world? Why is your pillow so flat? I like flat pillows. I don't know why. I'm sorry. No matter what size pillow you like, this is a trap. And and I don't just mean like getting sleep. You should get sleep. It's a spiritual thing to get sleep, okay? But the lure of comfort, the trap of comfort, this idea that life should be comfortable. It's a lie. It didn't come from God. And it will prevent us from taking joy in the grind. And and it's just this constant pull, and I know our society teaches us this. I know our society teaches this idea, but but I want to tell you, Jesus didn't say, pick up your pillow and follow me. He said, pick up your cross and follow me. A cross is a place of hardship and suffering and pain. If you want to follow Jesus, you are choosing to walk on a path of hardship. That sounds fun. Anyone want to join me? But there's purpose in the pain. And there can be a joy in the grind. Here's what I want to share with you when it comes to that lure of comfort, the lure of taking things easy. Do you know that easy never changed the world? Easy never changed the world. You look at the life of Jesus. Last night I was reading... In my devotions about Jesus, when he lost someone he loved, his cousin died, was killed actually, murdered, beheaded, and Jesus just wanted to get away. He wanted to spend some solitude time. And he couldn't get alone and get away. It was maddening. And yet the people that wouldn't leave him alone, he looked on them and instead of telling them to leave him alone, you know what he did? He fed them. He fed him. And he modeled for us over and over during his entire life that if you want to follow him, it's not a path of comfort and convenience and ease. It's a path of laying down the things we want, the things we want to do, and serving the people around us. The other temptation, the other, the other enemy of being grateful in the grind is is this thing. Right? I think nearby all of us is a towel that we're constantly tempted to throw in. 
And I, I just, man, the marriage is harder than I thought it would be. I thought it would be like Hollywood, and it's not. And so I'll try, I'll try doing this again with someone else. They're messed up. Yeah, you know, the, this, this job, it stinks. When they interviewed me, they acted like it was going to be fun and cool. It's not fun and cool. You, you know, this, this stage of life, everyone told me that this is the stage of life to look forward to. I'm not enjoying this. Everyone says, you know, you got young kids, enjoy this moment because it'll be over. And you're thinking, well, let it be over soon because I may not make it out. And there's so many stages of life we're constantly tempted to take the towel and throw it in. But what if this towel is here so we can wipe the sweat off our brow and keep working for Jesus Christ? What if the prize is in the work, the, the reward's in the process? There's a higher calling, and it's not selfish passion, but selfless purpose. See, it's been said that passion follows purpose. And if you choose to live a life where you're pursuing your own goals and dreams and milestones, you're going to find an incredibly unfulfilling existence that's always just one thing short of fulfilling you. Always. But if you choose a life of selfless purpose where God is your pursuit, there is a passion that follows that purpose, because life is no longer about you, about me. And I think what God wants to do for us is free us from these false expectations of life that discourage and disappoint us. I think what Paul is trying to do is show us that when he had a life-changing encounter with Jesus, he reoriented his focus around no longer himself, but around Jesus, and everything changed for Paul. See, Paul had a lot of dreams and passions and desires, and I'm guessing at the top of his list wasn't, man, I just want to get beaten and left for dead somewhere. My life would be great if that happened. Boy, if I could just get bit by a poisonous snake, poo, I would have arrived. If I could just get taken prisoner and then the ship get shipwrecked, yeah, that would, be, that would be great. I don't think that was at the top of Paul's list. And so Paul, though, as he faced those things, he faced them with such a determination and a joy, and he left us a trail of breadcrumbs that we might follow him. Here's one thing Paul said. He said, my life is worth nothing to me. This wasn't what I was saying growing up. My life... I wanted the next thing. Paul's like, no, no, no. My life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. He's like, I totally changed my perspective about life. I viewed life as a divine task, and my job is to finish the work God gives me, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of Jesus Christ. Paul found a way to change his perspective about life and work and hardship. And he found a way to be grateful in the grind. And it is not because he was superhuman. That guy was as messed up as you and me. It was because he changed the perspective of his life. So maybe, maybe this week, you're going to find joy simply by making somebody else a hot cup of coffee. Giving them a little bit of caffeine. It, maybe you're going to find joy when, when you're changing the diaper of your little baby. Despite the stink. Maybe you're going to find joy when you're wiping the snotty nose of your toddler. Maybe you're going to find joy when you're counseling your teenager that you've told something a hundred times and they just don't get it. Maybe you're going to find joy when you're, when you're serving that family member or that parent who's getting up there in age. Maybe you're going to find joy when you just open the doors of your home and invite people in for small group this week. And maybe you realize that the ordinary stuff, the mundane stuff, has new purpose 
when you do it for the glory of God. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Paul gives us some images that are kind of cool when he talks about the way that he chooses to live. He says when he runs, he's not running aimlessly. He's not just out for a Sunday jog. When he's running, he's running for a purpose. Every step has, has intention. And for Paul, that intention was, I'm going to do it for the glory of God. Paul says, when I'm, when I'm fighting, when I'm boxing, he says, I'm not just shadow boxing. You know what shadow boxing is? Right? There's no one there. You're just in the zone, right? Paul's like, I'm not shadow boxing. Like, I, I'm in a spiritual fight. I know who my enemy is. And I am giving him everything I've got for the glory of God. Because I know I have an enemy who wants to take me down and I know I have an enemy who wants to take my marriage down and I know I have an enemy who wants to take my family down and I know I have an enemy that wants to ruin my work and I know that. And so I'm not shadow boxing. I am fighting with every ounce in me because I'm doing it for the glory of God. Paul says, I'm not going to do it half-heartedly and I'm not going to do it because I don't care. I'm going to do it because I'm doing it for the glory of God. And you know what I'm finding as I'm getting older and as God is, I don't know, working more in my life, forgiving me more? I'm finding that I'm not asking Jesus to delay his return anymore. I can't wait for it. And there's a new joy and a purpose that comes through the hardship when I begin to realize that now might be the best moment of my life. This challenge, this hardship, this might be the joy and the prize and the reward. And maybe not the result of what happens, but maybe just God showing up in the middle of the pain. God showing up in the middle of the hurt. God showing up in the middle of the frustration. And that's enough. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. Can I be okay with that? Can I be okay with that? Because I think too often it's like, well, when I, when I get there, when I finally get healthy, when I, when I finally go on that family vacation, when, we, when my family can finally go to the place with the big mouse, when, <laughs> sorry, when we can finally do this or be here or when I can finally feel this way. And what if we just wake up tomorrow and realize when, when you're driving your kids from event to event, you're doing it for the glory of God. When, when you're preparing for school, kids, you're doing it not for the grade, not for your parents' approval, not even for your teachers. You're doing it for the glory of God. When you're, when you're struggling with a marriage that doesn't seem like it's going to work out, you're doing it for the glory of God. When you're talking with your spouse because you can't conceive and you want a kid, you're going through that pain. You're doing it for the glory of God. When you're stuck in a job that seems like a dead end, you're stuck in a cubicle or in a factory or in a car and, and you feel like there's no way out and you realize, I am doing this. For the glory of God. The prize is not when you arrive. Maybe the prize is in the process. The reward is the work. And what if with God's help, you and I learned this week to be grateful in the grind. Amen? Would you bow with me? In prayer, our music teams at all our campuses are going to come up right now. And I pray this morning that this attitude of gratitude that I've talked about, that it's, that it's not a burden to you, but that it's a relief to your soul. That it's not some religious burden or spiritual standard that you can't live up to. But it's a fresh outlook. It's a way to view life differently. 
And so I'm going to say a prayer right now asking God for this perspective for myself. And if that's your, hair, your prayer, your desire, your heart, maybe you pray this too. But Father God, for myself, I'm asking that you teach me to find joy in all things. Teach me to be grateful in the grind. Help me to realize that your spirit is within me and you're working all things for my good. God, I, I give up my expectation that things will be comfortable and I give up my desire to throw in the towel when they aren't. God, I desire to learn how to de deny myself, take up my cross, and follow you. Whatever I do, I do for your glory. Thank you for being with me. Thank you this week for being with us. May your goodness and your joy overflow out of our lives into others. Teach us this year to have less us and more you. And God, I pray for the person who's here today or listening today who, who does not yet follow you. I pray that today is the day where they deny themselves. They take up their cross and they follow you. They, they receive your forgiveness. They surrender their life and choose to follow someone who's so much better than them, someone who's willing to forgive them, someone who could lead their life far better than they ever could, that they would turn from their sin and their past and they would turn towards you, the God who takes broken, messed up things and restores and rebuilds from the ground up. God, thank you. Even for the grind, teach us to be grateful. In Jesus' name, amen.